Alan, you are in the land of bearded gentlemen. You, you're looking very trim, uh, relatively. Uh, is this the Minnesota summer kicking in? What is the occasion that you have decided to, to, uh, you know, move those metal shavings from the bottom of your head to the top of your head, if you will? <laughs> I feel like I got a haircut too, though. So I'm just generally trimmer and, and, uh, just generally a little trimmer. Yeah. I mean, part of it's the Minnesota summer. Part of it is that my, uh, my, my youngest is now six months old. And therefore I feel like I'm coming out of the, the bleary eyed confusion of having a, a tiny, a tiny baby, tiny, tiny baby. Don't worry, Scott. You'll, uh, it, it gets better as they say. Uh, but you know that, of course. <laughs> I believe it when I see it. Yeah. Um, but also I was in Miami over, over the weekend and I got to say Miami in June is, uh, it's a lot like the, just the humidity really smacks you in the face. And so I decided to make my face a little less humid. My favorite Miami phenomenon is that it's a Benjamin Wittes favorite city, right? It's the, like the one time I feel like I see you not in a dog shirt these days is when you put on the, uh, Cuban shirt, like a linen with five pockets <laughs> to go to Miami in the hat, ready I, for that warm weather. I love Miami. It is a fabulous food city. It has my favorite restaurant in the country. And it has, at least Miami Beach, has incredible architecture of a faded glory variety. And I, I think it is going to be the American Venice as it sinks into the Atlantic uh, in, with climate change. And I, I love Miami. I, I, I don't understand why it takes such uh, uh, shit from everybody. Because it is, it is absurd. And I, I will say this as someone who has been visiting Miami literally since he was six months, six months old. My, my grandmother bought a place in North Miami Beach, which is like the kind of residential quiet part of Miami Beach and, and now lives there full time. And so I have spent, I have definitely spent more time in Miami than, than all of you combined. And it has wonderful features, but it is also a absolutely absurd place. I love the absurdity. And I love the fact that the last time I spent time there, I woke up in the morning and walked to my hotel room window and flying by my uh, my window was a airplane pulling a, uh, you know, one of those uh, banners that said something like shoot machine guns. I was going to say, I was going to say, I was, I was about to, I was about to follow up and say, yeah, but the best one is the shoot machine guns banner. I am so glad right. to say, I know exactly the banner you're talking about. It is crazy because you can go to like gun ranges 30, 30 minutes out of Miami and shoot. I mean, they could probably shoot like a, a anti tank weaponry. I mean, at that point. I will say I have a friend who was living in Miami for work and recently moved, and she described it as a place where, and I quote, you can get a gun in a vending machine. Um, and it took me like a little bit to realize that she was joking because it sounds like something that could happen in Miami. I'm surprised more people just don't start shooting at the plane. If it's just saying shoot machine guns. And an inspection. I feel like that's the risk. Exactly. They really got to punctuate that very carefully. It's a situation where the Oxford comma might be very important, depending on what your directions are that follow. Scott, that is the most DC thing anyone has ever said about the most Miami thing that has ever happened. There we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Rational Security. I am one of your regular co-hosts, Scott R. Anderson. Thrilled to be back in the IRL studio with one of my other regular co-hosts, Quinta Jurassic. Hello. And in the virtual studio with our third regular co-host, Alan Rosenstein. Hello, hello. Reunited at last, the three of us, and joined by co-host Emeritus, I can finally say it correctly, Lawfare <laughs> Editor-in-Chief Benjamin Wittes here in the real studio with us. Ben, thank you for joining us again this week. My pleasure. We are excited to have you for what we are calling the Miami Vices edition in virtue, in uh, honor of Alan's suave, suave new, uh, tropical weather look because we have a number of items in the national security news and in the headlines of papers that are up your alley and up some of our allies that we are excited to break down with you. And of course, with the listening audience for our first topic, save the last gants. <laughs> that, that, that's no, that's good. That's really good, Scott. That's okay, really good. Okay. I just, I just want to say the thing that I miss the most in your extended Wait, I, I parental leave. I want to give leave. you a round of applause for that. Oh wow! Do we do we have a sound effects board now? That's awesome. I like how this this, this is dangerous knowledge. <laughs> it's very dangerous, <laughs> very dangerous. especially in Ben Wittes' hands. <laughs> I have a lot of them. <laughs> I like how uh, also the 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 pre recorded one has one guy yelling really aggressively. <laughs> yeah. <Yes. laughs> dangerous. 
Going, going back to our topic, going back to our topic, Zave the Last Gantz, leading opposition figure Benny Gantz has left Israel's war cabinet over Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's failure to establish post-conflict plans for Gaza, raising serious questions about the stability of Netanyahu's far-right government. What does Gantz's departure mean for the future of the conflict? Can, can, I, can I just ask, can I just ask, how many Bennies are there in Israel politics? Bennies, BBs? Is, I mean, do you have to be a Benny to be a high-level Israeli politician? No, no, there's, um, I mean, it's, it's not an uncommon nickname, but it's not a, you know, it's not like Udi or, or the really sort of proto Israeli nicknames. I love, this is my favorite, one of my favorite features of, of studying the Middle East and particularly Israeli politics for a long time in history is seeing so many tough, hardened generals have been through such things being given nicknames that I would be a little embarrassed to give my cat. Well, yeah, that's, that's been the rule, that's, of, that's my rule yeah. of Israeli it's nicknames. the scariest guy is also named Dudu or something. <laughs> no, it's the more badass somebody's military career, the more that likely they are to have shot you know, somebody in at point blank range, the more they sound like their nickname sounds like an adorable Muppet. <laughs> <laughs> so Buttercup's Gantz is what, is what we're breaking about. <laughs> That's here. the guy you really want to Yeah, get exactly. Uh, for our second topic, topic two, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of beep or of the press <laughs> key. California is on the <laughs> California is on the verge of enacting one of the country's first AI safety laws. But critics are arguing that the type of restrictions it imposes may run afoul of the First Amendment. How does AI fit with the freedom of speech, and does the First Amendment put it beyond regulatory reach? And topic three, a stale Macron is one tough cookie. I really like that one. No one else does. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. I was trying to figure out a way to make a joke about the Madelines, and I, I can't do it. Fair, fair. I struggled with this one for a while, but I'm glad we're landed. I, don't, I regret nothing. Uh, recent elections to the European Parliament saw a surge in right and particularly far right parties across the continent, and most specifically in France and Germany. Fearing what this groundswell might mean for a centrist coalition, French President Emmanuel Macron has sought to cut it off at the pass by calling for snap national parliamentary elections. But is this a sound strategy or a risky one? given the broader dynamics in Europe and in France. For our first topic, Alan, let me hand it over to you to get us started. Yeah, so, I mean, Scott, you you described only one thing, only one of the many things that's happened in Israel and, and in uh, sure. uh, that region over the last week. So, obviously, we have uh, Benny Gantz leaving the war cabinet. We also have the uh, Israeli military conducting an operation to rescue four hostages, that were being held in Gaza, um, resulting in the deaths of, well, it's unclear, but, you know, likely several hundred Palestinians. Again, it's unclear what the, the mix of that is between combatants and, and civilians and, um, you know, exactly the circumstance in which they died, but obviously a, a hostage rescue that has, you know, created a lot of jubilation in Israel and, and in some parts of the United States and also a lot of controversy given the civilian casualties there. Uh, in addition, we have uh, this ongoing negotiation or this ongoing talks between Israel and uh, Hamas, mediated by the United States and, and several Arab nations to lead to a ceasefire and the release of hostages. Um, we're recording this on Wednesday morning. Um, as of now, it is continues to be unclear what the status of th those talks are. The latest appears to be that Hamas has, well, Hamas would say that it is, is uh, offering alternatives Israel and the United States are saying that Hamas has essentially rejected uh, those talks uh, or the deal on the table. Um, and also something that's uh, you know just happened is that the the UN Human Rights Council uh, has released its findings that both Israel and Hamas have committed war crimes. So just a, a huge amount that's that's happened. Um, but we might as well start with Scott what you described uh, at the top and Benny Gantz leaving uh, the war cabinet. So let me let me ask you, Ben. I'm going to ask a Ben about a Ben who's leaving another Ben. To the point about all the the, the Bennies in, in Israel. Buttercup Wittis. Buttercup <laughs> Wittis. Butter, there we go. Buttercup Wittis. Um, excellent. Well, let me first ask why Benny Gantz is doing this. And, and then second, how big of a deal this is, both in the short term and then in the medium long term. So he's doing it because the national emergency that brought – that caused the formation of this government. Remember that Benny Gantz is a centrist who was never part of the BB coalition, at least in this iteration. They were forced together by the national emergency 
that happened on October 7th or that began, the vision of this government was always as a temporary thing. And it came together with the idea that Israelis suspend politics in moments of national crisis. Politics have clearly reemerged in Israel in a big way. There are major demonstrations. There are a lot of people in Israel, including Benny Gantz, who want there to be new elections at this point. And so the idea that you would continue to sit in this government under those circumstances doesn't make a lot of sense. And so he has stopped. The other factor is that I think he uh, very much wants this hostage deal to happen. And Bibi uh, does not. And he wants to continue the operation. So far, the Israelis have not been put in the position of being the rate limiting step because Hamas keeps rejecting serial proposals. That puts the Israelis in the happy position of being able to seem to sometimes support a deal without actually having to have one. But Bibi clearly doesn't want one, and Benny Gantz does. And so, uh, as by the way, does the majority of the Israeli population at this point. And so it's it's both, I think, a matter of principle, but also a matter of uh, political best practice, be on the side of the majority. And it's a return to his natural state, which is he's not a member of this government. It, he's a opposition figure. And by the way, the most popular politician in the country, the polls suggest that if you had an election tomorrow, Benny Gantz would probably be the prime minister. And so he's better off outside the government. There are principled reasons for him to be outside the government. And um, he disagrees with the government on some pretty foundational stuff. So how much does this matter? Right. My understanding is, is that Netanyahu doesn't need Benny Gantz to have a government. He 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 has enough votes in the Knesset, especially with his far right support. So you know, I assume in the short term, this doesn't change anything. Or my correct, uh, except it matters for one very important reason, which is actually a bad thing, which is that it makes BB wholly dependent on the far right of his government, which opposes things like any kind of hostage deal or ceasefire, uh, which has been intransigent on the subject of delivery of humanitarian aid, uh, and which has ambitions to do things like resettle Gaza. And so there's a, you know, it, it, it makes BB a wholly, wholly captive of this faction or groups of factions, as well as of the ultra-Orthodox, which want other things from him. Uh, so it, you know, it reduces Bibi's maneuvering room. Uh, the second thing is, is it means the government could fall at any time if any faction were to grow too dissatisfied. Whereas in the past, under the emergency government arrangement, uh, he could always fall back on Benny Gantz and his faction. You'd really have to have two groups leave. Now you could have one group leave and the government could fall. And so it makes Bibi's situation more precarious, more dependent on the worst people in the Israeli political system. But also, you're right, in the short term, does very little. And so if if this makes his situation more precarious because – if any of the sort of partners bail, he's done. What are the things that could make those partners bail? So there's really three of them. Uh, the first is that his defense minister, Yoav Gallant, uh, who, of course, in the rest of the world is seen as a kind of monster. Um, you know, he's subject to an ICC uh, arrest uh, warrant as is you know, Bibi, uh, he's, um, you know, a villain, villainized figure, uh, as a result of the way Israel has conducted the war. But in Israel, he is one of the very few political figures who've been, uh, who's emerged from this process more admired than before. 
And the reason is, first of all, that he's been pretty independent of BB. He's not. Um, but secondly, he's uniquely among the Israeli political establishment. He took responsibility for uh, January uh, for January sixth for uh, for October seventh. <laughs> it just all bleeds into one giant global catastrophe. And he, um, uh, you know, spoke movingly about that in a way that Bibi has not. Um, so Yoav Gallant has made very similar noises to Benny Gantz. He wants a uh, a, a day after plan. He wants to know that. Uh, there isn't going to be a plan to resettle Gaza, which is, a, you know, something that should be obvious, but is not. Um, and he wants, uh, some, some horizon in which it is not Israeli forces responsible for, you know, street to street municipal services in Gaza. Uh, he has not said he will leave the government over it, but he has not said he will not leave the government over it. And the question is whether he could take a few people with him that could bring down the government. The second possibility, I think the more likely possibility is that the United States maneuvers BB into some kind of hostage for ceasefire arrangement, this would require Hamas to agree, which they're disinclined to do for reasons of their own. Uh, if that were to happen, the far right might bring down the government. And then the third possibility is this long simmering unrelated matter, which involves ultra orthodox conscription, which I won't go into in any detail. The Supreme Court of Israel has said that they need a law on this subject. The ultra orthodox have said we won't, you know, we won't sit for that in in a government. And so there is a different group of political parties, and it's important to remind people or tell people who may not know that ultra orthodox does not mean right or far right. It's a different axis. Um, the Ultra-Orthodox parties uh, will, you know, they bargain very hard for over matters like conscription and uh, they they could bring down the government over that. And so it's a tough thing to navigate. And remember, Bibi's government was quite unpopular for reasons that predate October 7th, uh, you know, involving the judicial reform matters. So there's a lot of simmering underlying tensions that have kind of been put on hold as a result of October 7th, but are are not too far in the backs of everybody's minds. All right. So 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 much for Israeli politics. I'm going to kind of do this kind of bullet point style just because there's so much to, to talk about. I, I do want to talk about next the, the hostage rescue operation. You know, I, I want to again emphasize that the civilian death toll in Gaza from that operation is still very much in dispute. Uh, again, you know, Hamas obviously controls the Gaza Health Ministry. In the past, it has been quite inaccurate in often describing civilian casualties. One assumes that some portion of that, you know, 300 or sort of high 200 figure that's often cited is Hamas, you know, and then there's questions about exactly under what circumstances the civilians died. But I think it is safe to say, all that said, is that there was a large civilian death toll. Um, and, and so I, I think um, you know, we should operate under that premise. Now, that obviously raises questions, as has been the case throughout the war in Gaza, of proportionality and necessity, sort of the standard uh, law of war stuff. A and what I'm curious about, and, and I want to start with you, Scott, since you're our kind of international law expert, um, should we think, should we analyze this operation to rescue hostages any differently than we would analyze any other operation as part of the broader war in, in Gaza? And I, I will say personally, and I'm not an international law expert. On the one hand, you know, it, it, it's, it's difficult for me to blame the Israelis for trying to rescue hostages, given how long it's been, given how many hostages have died in, in Hamas captivity and, and that this whole war started in large part because Hamas you know, went and, and took several hundred hostages. Uh, on the other hand, um, it would be odd if there was some sort of international law exception for hostage rescue operations. I mean, presumably, the, the same principles apply 
although perhaps in a different way. So I am, as I have been continuously for the last nine months, confused and dispirited. So help me out. So, so there's no special rules for hostage rescues, but there's reason to think that they might reasonably fit into the calculation that international humanitarian law urges and requires a little bit differently than other civilians, right? In all other things being equal, uh, military officers need to take principles where they're not supposed to be targeting is principle distinction that says you're not supposed to be targeting civilian targets. Principle of precaution saying we're supposed to be minimizing or, or, or to the extent feasible, uh, the incidental harm to civilians by virtue of us attacking military targets. And then the, uh, principle of military necessity, which is that we're only supposed to be doing things that for which there's a strategic objective. But those strategic objectives are informed by the political leadership and by the circumstances. And here, here's a case where I think there's a very reasonable case that rescuing hostages isn't just about calculating the life of, in this case, four Israeli civilians versus however many Palestinians. It's wrapped into broader strategic goals about setting a deterrent effect, uh, on the, uh, incentive that groups like Hamas face to seize Israeli citizens or do other things to Israelis on signaling, uh, as part of the broader campaign, the intent and deliberation and willingness of the Israeli military forces to go and pursue these sorts of action. So I don't think that it necessarily is a problem under international humanitarian law or even likely a problem under international humanitarian law to pursue these military operations, to pursue them in a way that has civilian casualties incidentally, um, not dur- not by virtue of, of intentionality, but incidentally, and that those civilian casualties on the Palestinian side, tragic, uh, you know, should be minimized, but nonetheless, I think reasonably probably are, are greater than a one-to-one ratio in a lot of cases. You know, you could get uh, multiples. It's when you get to the scale that you appear like you very well might have had here that it, I think legitimate questions do get raised. Because, again, you're really only supposed to be doing this in a way that it's operationally necessary. And that doesn't mean that you can do things that eliminate all risk to your troops, which you can't do and, and didn't happen here. It's worth noting, you know, one Israeli um, special police officer was was killed uh, in the assault, uh, at least, uh, that we've we've seen reported. But it, it sounds like from what we understand, from what I understand from press, press accounts, this operation was preceded by a pretty intensive bombing campaign in the vicinity here. And it's the details of that that will matter for people trying to evaluate it under international humanitarian law. They'll say, well, what was targeted as bombing campaign? You can't just blanket bomb an area, regardless of what, particularly a civilian inhabited area in preparation for an assault particularly if there's at least other strategic alternatives. And then what was the marginal return on the strategic advantage of taking this sort of step? Like what were you actually trying to deter by this? How did it feed into your strategy? What was the tactical significance? The thing is all these things require a lot of subjective judgment. And the standard we're supposed to be applying is the subjective judgment of the Israeli war fighters when they're making these plans and executing them based on the information they had available to them at the time. It's a big reconstructive effort and involves just a lot of subjectivity and kind of squishiness, um, to borrow a term uh, that I recently uh, heard an international legal scholar use to describe these things. That makes it hard to objectively say, yeah, this was in violation of international law or not. There are bright lines. You know, if it becomes evident that Israelis really did just target a civilian facility knowingly, that's a bright line that would be unlawful. But it's not clear that that happened here. But that doesn't mean that there isn't room to criticize it either because – it all comes down to how you measure these different variables against each other and reasonable minds might differ on that. And there's a certain point where people might be acting in a way that is uh, taking advantage of some of the squishiness um, in a certain way or at least at least not paying due respect to these different principles that are supposed to weigh in uh, in a way that warrants criticism even if you can't firmly and unimpeachably say, yes, this was in violation of this bright line rule of IHL. So in long story short, it, it suffers from the same dynamics of a lot of military operations in this conflict, and it fits in that same challenging rubric that has provided the grounds for such divergent opinions and perspectives on the conflict throughout the last several months. Yeah, so a couple things. The first is the actual raw numbers really do matter. So if you take the Palestinian number and you say 275 people were killed – of whom some large percentage, the Palestinian health ministry never distinguishes between civilians and non, but whom, but among some large number of whom were civilians and 65 were children. That gives me a lot of pause, um, just numerically, not because I weigh four 
hostage lives and one Israeli soldier life against 275 and say that's an imbalance. But because I just have a hard time instinctively believing that it was necessary to kill 275 people to rescue this group of people. I I have no basis for saying that. I just – that's just my instinct. If you take the Israeli numbers, that the number of casualties were less than 100 and a lot of them were Hamas fighters, um, well, then you get into the land of maybe it was just a really good operation. They went into a civilian area because their hostages were being held by civilians, actually, um, civilians directly participating in hostility. Some of the civilians they killed may have been people who were directly involved in keeping hostages. By the way, you're allowed to kill those people. I mean, are they civilians? I mean, I think this is a point worth – worth. Right. If they're directly participating in hostilities, you move into a different category. No, no, no. They are called civilians directly participating in hostilities and they right, are lawful targets. That's, right. that's what I mean. Right, they move the into point, the category of a lawful the, target. But the point is when, when you are a civilian DPH – you know, an international organization may call you a civilian, but the IDF doesn't call you a civilian and nor should it. And so I want to actually know who were the civilians, who were the Hamas fighters, who were the Hamas co-optees who were in some sense directly participating in hostilities. And you give me all that information and then explain the factors that Scott was uh, describing what what this all looked like from the point of view prospectively of the Israeli warfighter, and then I can tell you what I think of the of the operation, but without at least a lot of that information, I can't say more than they shouldn't be d- conducting operations in a fashion that kill more civilians than necessary, and it is both legitimate for Israel to engage in hostage rescue operations and delusional to anybody – for anybody to think that they wouldn't, to think that Israel wouldn't go in to a populated area to rescue hostages is to completely misunderstand the entire Israeli warfighting psyche. They don't leave their people – in Gaza or in Lebanon or – and so, you know, it, 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 it's not just that it's legitimate. It's that it's unthinkable that they wouldn't do this. So the only relevant question to me is do they do it in a fashion that is as, as, as lethal to the other side's fighters and as protective of the other side's civilians as possible – or did they not do that? That seems to, and that's an unanswerable question based on current information. Okay, so before we move off this topic, I, I do want to spend a few minutes talking about the latest on the negotiations. Um, so, Scott, where are we? You know, should we be surprised that Hamas appears to have rejected this latest round? And is this, you know, particular a sign of okay, we're in negotiations, so everyone's rejecting things, but we're negotiating, or, you know we're just going to be in a stalemate because at the end of the day, Hamas is actually in a pretty good strategic position. They don't really care about Gazan civilians. And the longer they drag this out, the more the world continues to turn against Israel, which is ultimately the the main Hamas objective. Yeah. You know, I think it's worth thinking about how we've arrived at this conclusion that uh, Hamas has rejected um, this proposal, which, which the statement was delivered by the Israeli foreign ministry. Um, that's the interpretation of the Hamas's communication. Now, we know Hamas has come out and said, we still want other things out of this deal. Specifically, we want a more complete exit and immediate cessation of hostilities from the Israelis. So the question is, is that reiterating that demand, is that an end of the negotiations? Is that a rejection of the deal? How much does this enter into the process? You know, my instinct is from having watched a lot of negotiations like this and been involved in vaguely similar negotiations with very different parties in the past, is that this is just 
a part of this process when you have parties that are adamantly opposed, in particular, don't communicate with each other and are working inherently through proxies and are doing it in a very uh, kind of target-rich information environment where they're each trying to shape the uh, narratives emerging both in the public and with other, you know, involved parties, particularly the United States on this. You know, what I suspect happened is that uh, Hamas came back and said, no, we still have the same demands ever, but we're still talking about this. The Israelis would prefer to stop talking about this because this is a demand that's putting a lot of pressure on Bibi. So they say Hamas has rejected it. This is dead. Uh, they don't go quite that far, but that's the implication. And now we have to wait and see what the Biden administration says about it. I don't think the Biden administration is going to come out and say Hamas has rejected. This is dead. I think they're going to say we're still working towards some sort of common position on this and that they're going to go back to the tables and try and get the parties to a more solid yes along the rough framework that has now been endorsed by the UN Security Council 14 to 0 to 1 uh, with Russia abstaining. So, you know, pressure is building on the parties here. And and the point of dynamic, you know, about the global pressure is true to an extent. I mean, you're right. There, I think the dynamics do globally come to put more pressure on the Israelis because the Israelis are the one who are most – actively continuing hostilities to some extent. But Hamas is too, to some degree. And Hamas is in a circumstance where they're under very active assault, right? Like they think they time, they have time pressure on them as well. The thing is that both parties are in a classic kind of war of attrition model. If you go back to like strategic logic or uh, kind of economic logic, they're each trying to say, we're going to hold out. We think the other party is going to hurt more if we drag out these proceedings and therefore we'll be able to get more favorable terms on what we actually care about. The real question is we just don't know which party's timeline actually maxes, maxes out first to get to a point where the Biden administration can uh, and other international actors can try and get them to roughly the same page enough to actually execute something. Wow. I completely disagree. <laughs> oh, with I want to hear it. I'm curious. <laughs> um, so fight, fight. No, no, no. I, 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 I think like Scott's analysis of it is fascinating. I just, I have a completely different one. I think that the calculation on Hamas's side is that they can't release all the hostages because it's the only thing that's keeping a bunch of them alive. And they also, in fact, can't account for a bunch of them. And I think they don't want to admit that. And they're very afraid that once, once they release the last hostage, uh, or the last group of hostages, the Israelis will just assault the last positions that they have. And of course, they may well be right about that. The Israeli calculation, I think, is that Netanyahu knows that as soon as he agrees to an, a deal, his government is going to fall. And he's probably okay with that, actually. But he wants to buy himself as much time as possible because He's killing a lot of Hamas guys and he's in a better position both electorally and frankly in terms of what I think his genuine objectives are if this goes on another three or four months and there's 5,000 more dead Hamas guys and probably a lot more dead Palestinian civilians. But that's not a high, cal you know, high salience calculation for him. So for Hamas, the question is, how do we avoid having to account for this and giving up the thing that's in fact our our best bargaining chip? And for the Israelis, the calculation is how can we string this along so that we continue in a favorable operating environment in every forum except one, which is world opinion? I, I don't disagree with that at all. I mean, what you're describing is I think the exact dynamics of what the war of attrition logic is leading both parties to do. They both have an incentive to draw this out because they think that over time their relative position will become more advantageous. And it's, you're right that that is not just a calculus vis a vis each other, but vis a vis the individual actors broader context. So Netanyahu's domestic political possibilities. Uh, what I was just responding to is, is that there, it's not an unlimited runway. There are countervailing time pressures that are going to build on both parties, not just the Israelis. And that is something that they both have to calculate. But I, my suspicion is that they still see advantage in delay in the short to medium term and that uh, you are going to see – we're going to see more delay. We still are a ways away from getting to an agreement, not just because of the substance but because of the posturing of the two parties, both for their – vis-a-vis each other in regards to their own kind of – Domestic audiences isn't quite right, but their own other constituencies they have to take into account. Let us go now from the West Bank or thereabouts-ish <laughs> to the West Coast. 
let's go from one place to another where <laughs> things are also happening. Things are also <laughs> happening. You know, so, that's what we do. It's it's actual, uh, this is this what we call a classic Jurassic segue. <laughs> I wasn't even responsible for this one. <laughs> you know, guys, segways are hard. It's fine. We're working on it. The state of California is up to some interesting things in the realm of artificial intelligence. It looks like the state legislature is perhaps on the verge of enacting what would be the first, as far at least to my knowledge, substantive, meaningful set of AI safety requirements and regulations at the statewide level. But of course, being California, the home of many of the companies developing AI and no doubt uh, housing many of the people who work there and facilities that are conducting that sort of work, a very meaningful entity in terms of regulation. But it is not doing so without a degree of backlash. We have already seen individuals from several quarters step out and say, among other complaints about this law uh, and the substance of it, that it is may in fact be unconstitutional or beyond the constitutional authority of California to enact because it is in violation of First Amendment rights that are inherently implicated by artificial intelligence and the use thereof. Alan, you wrote a really interesting piece this past week uh, with a couple of your friends and colleagues Delving into some of these First Amendment arguments, uh, we thought we would spend a little time talking over today, along with some of the other concerns that uh, are implicated by this law. Walk us through a little bit. What are the First Amendment concerns this law raises, legitimate or no, the First Amendment arguments, I should say? And, and then why is it that you and your colleagues don't arrive at the conclusion that this is a major barrier? Although I think you acknowledge that it doesn't mean that's not couldn't couldn't be a barrier in at least some circumstances. Yeah, so so let me let me start by just briefly describing what this law is is about. So, you know, there are plenty so so this law uh, Senate Bill SB 1047 um which is uh, I think it's made its way through the California House and it needs to no, it's made its way through the California Senate and needs to then make its way through the House and is a bit of a moving target. Uh so there'll still be some amendments on it, but um it, you know, it, it's true that it's the first kind of AI safety piece of legislation. Um, though, of course, it's not the first piece of AI legislation that either California or other states have passed. There are plenty of laws have been passed regulating the use of AI systems. What's notable about this law is that it regulates the development of those systems. And I think that's why people are focusing so much on it. Um, so like I said, it's still a bit of a moving target. But basically, it says, look, if you're the developer of, you know, large state-of-the-art foundation models, So kind of roughly tracking what the um, Biden executive order from last year tried to focus on. You have certain obligations. Some of these are pretty straightforward, you know, transparency and reporting, but uh, some go much further. In in particular, it says, if your model could potentially be used to create certain harms, and it lists those harms, you know, it's it's the kind of existential harms that people are really worried about, like, um, you know, helping develop a, a biological or chemical weapon, for example. And you can't certify that your model won't do that. And it's very hard to certify if models can do things because we barely understand how these models work. Then you have to uh, implement a bunch of additional safeguards. So you have to, for example, include um, a, you know, a kill switch into that model. Um, again, it's not entirely clear what that means to put a kill switch. I have one here on my uh, <laughs> thing that works like this. Hang on. See, it doesn't work. Well, you're now in violation of, of California yeah, law. Exactly. <laughs> it's the problem with kill switches, right? It's <laughs> yeah, yeah, there we go. You have to have a, a sad trombone kill switch in, in your model. You have to and, – and also you have to make sure that no one can uh, access it or modify it without authorization, which on the face of it makes a lot of sense, but um, actually means that open source models are probably – would be probably illegal, under this law, because the whole point of an open source model, and this is specifically a model in which the the parameters uh, of the model um, are public, um, once that's out there, then it obviously can be modified. That's kind of the whole point of them. Um, and although um, a lot of the foundation, you know, the most advanced models out there right now, so GPT-4.0, which is OpenAI, Claude Opus, which is Anthropic, and Gemini 1.5, which is Google, although they are not open source, um, Meta has been releasing really powerful open source models, um, the, the so-called llama models. And although they're not quite as advanced, uh, as the, um, the other models, they're, they're very advanced, um, and are, are quite important. 
so the law requires this and, and the law says, obviously, you know, if, if you don't do this, then you can't publish your models and then we'll, you know, go after you with, with at least civil penalties. I don't remember if there's criminal enforcement potentially as well, but it's, it's a, it's a serious law. So that's what the law does. Now, there are lots of arguments pro and con about the, the policy stakes of it. Um, I, I tend to not be a huge fan of laws like this. I also tend to think that they should not be done on the state level. I think it's fine for states to regulate the use of AI in their states and, and different states can have different rules. I think it's odd for a state to say you can't develop AI in our state given that the development, especially you know California, which is where all the AI models for the United States are developed, that feels like a, a decision that should be made at the at the national, not state level. But these are all sorts of policy concerns. The constitutional issues that people have been talking about are about the First Amendment. Uh, and Scott, you pointed out that obviously California can't violate the First Amendment, um, but it actually goes beyond California. If these First Amendment concerns are valid, then no one can implement these kind of, of safety laws. So not just California, but also the federal government. So th- there are two kind of different kinds of First Amendment arguments. Um, one that my co-authors and I, um, and the, the, I wrote uh, a piece on lawfare, um, last week with Peter Salib, who's a law professor at the University of Houston, and, uh, Donnie Bloomfeld, who's an uh, incoming law professor at Fordham. Um, so we think that some of these arguments are, are potentially valid and we'll talk about them. But we think the main one is really problematic. And so the main one goes something like this. There's a set of cases from the 1990s, um, out in particular of the Ninth Circuit called the Bernstein cases. And they stand for the proposition, or they have been interpreted to stand for the proposition, that computer code is speech. So basically, in the 1990s, there were export controls on encryption software. This was the the first crypto war. And this guy, Bernstein, who was a computer programmer and a cryptologist, he had written a new encryption uh, algorithm, and he wrote it as an academic paper, but also as some uh, computer code. And he wanted to post that online because he wanted to communicate with his fellow cryptographers, and that would have violated the export controls uh, at the time on uh, on cryptographic software. So uh, he sued, um, and both the district court and the Ninth Circuit uh, found that not just the academic paper, but the computer code that he wrote was itself speech because he was using it to communicate with others. Now, interestingly, what happened was the Ninth Circuit ended up rehearing the case on Bonk, therefore withdrawing all the lower opinions. But before that actually the rehearing happened, the uh, uh, Bernstein and the State Department, which was running the export controls, came to a settlement. And so th- those cases actually are, are like th- – those cases are not – law in the Ninth Circuit. But they um, were so influential and they were actually picked up by some other cases around the country that um, there's this kind of Bernstein doctrine, which again, technically speaking, does not exist, interestingly. But that stands for the proposition, very um, simplified, that code is speech. And so if code is speech, well, fast forward to now, what are large language models? Well, they're just code in a sense. I mean, there's code that goes into the training of them. But you know, the parameters, the billion, hundred billion, trillion parameters, I mean, that's part of the code of the model. Um, Or to think of it differently, you know, you can think of a a, a large language model as one very, very large equation, uh, where the parameters um, are the kind of coefficients. Um, You know, if you think of an equation, right, like AX plus BY plus CZ, right, you know, the X, Y, and Z um, are the inputs, uh, and then you have the uh, the A, B, and C are the parameters that are tuned over training. Um, well, that's also, I guess, a kind of code, and so therefore it should be speech. Lin- linear algebra is protected by the First Amendment. I mean, yeah, certainly matrix multiplication. Uh, yeah, the idea is matrix multiplication is protected by by the First Amendment. And at the end of the day, what is code but a set of instructions to a computer to basically just do addition uh, on binary numbers? And so if you think that models are code, then any restrictions on models are potentially violating the First Amendment. In particular, they may even be prior restraints because not even allowing the model to go out and do stuff. And prior restraints are, you know, the most disfavored under the First Amendment. Um, and so that's basically how the argument goes. And, and our response to this is to say that uh, the, the premise of this, which is that code is speech, is itself very oversimplified. That code should rightfully be viewed as speech in certain circumstances, in particular, where code is used by people to communicate ideas to other people, which is to say, where code is used to further what the First Amendment is meant to do, which is communicate. And so, you know, the reason that's important is because if you actually look at what the weights and models of a model are, which is, again, just a billion or a potentially, you know, a trillion long list of numbers, that's not communicating anything to anyone for two reasons. First, 
you can't communicate like that. Like that's just not a useful way. Like, you know, if, if I, if I want to describe some new algorithm that I've come up with, right? Like some new way of calculating Fibonacci numbers, like I can write 30 lines of Python and send that to someone. And that's actually a way of communicating with them. But if I send them like the machine code of my, of my compiled uh, Fibonacci number generator, like that's just going to be meaningless gibberish to people. So, you know, one problem with the argument is that model weights aren't actually communication. And the other problem is that even if they were communication, it's not actually because of the communication about anything. Models don't, I mean, there's kind of an interesting kind of philosophical and metaphysical question, and it's actually becoming very important in copyright litigation on these models, of whether the models like encode information or whether they are better viewed as instructions to generate things. Now, in some sense, they do both. But you know, at the end of the day, it's not like the information let's say that the model is trained on is inside is 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 represented exactly in the parameters themselves so even even if you were communicating something um through the model even if people could read a list of a trillion numbers and like oh, okay that's communication it's not clear what exactly is being communicated and so you know for these reasons we think that these first seven arguments against ai safety legislation is really problematic although the three of us don't take a position in part because we disagree amongst ourselves, which is always kind of the, the most fun way to write these pieces over the underlying merits of, of the law. Now, we do think that there are potential First Amendment issues, and we can talk about like the kind of corner cases where that would come up, but I've been filibustering for a while, so um, I'll, I'll stop talking. So I have a lot of questions about this, but the first one is, if I'm understanding you correctly, and tell me if I'm wrong, that part of the reason why you don't think that there's a particularly strong First Amendment argument here is because the models themselves are black boxes. So it's – yeah, so it depends on what you mean by a black box. Like if you put if you put stuff in, it's difficult to describe it as having a communicative function because the thing that you get out, you don't – you don't know what the process internally is and therefore you don't know what's being communicated. Yeah. So that's, that's definitely part of it. But I think even if they weren't black boxes, I think you still wouldn't have a good first seven argument. So interesting work is being done on interpretability. And I think I want to say Anthropic just released a paper, but if a different AI lab did, my apologies, where they can actually um, look into the model and they can actually identify areas where um, the kind of that light up. Yeah, that was anthropic. That yeah, was yeah, Claude. yeah. That was Claude, right? They, they, it, you can kind of sort of imagine a, 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 a sort of analogy to when they put people in fMRI machines and look at their brains and they, they show them pictures and parts of the brain light up. Um, people are beginning to do that for these models, and they can do cool things like they can sort of what the anthropic folks did is they they quote unquote turned up the part of the model that uh, that encoded. Or, or that represented in some way, um, or that fired when the model thought about, I'm doing all this in quotation marks, it's so hard to describe this, um, the Golden Gate Bridge. And so they got this uh, version of the model that thought it was the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, just by upregulating that part of the model, kind of almost in the same way that that if you could find, you know, some part of someone's brain um, that uh, lit, lit up um, when they thought about something, and you could stimulate that part of the brain, um, you could get that person to think that thought kind of more intensely than they otherwise would. Um, so all of this is to say that there's actually a lot of work being done on interpretability. But even if that was the case, it's still not clear that publishing, you know, a model, which is, again, means to publish the, you know, the weights and biases, that that would be communicating between one person and another person. I think that's the important point here. The First Amendment is about communicating ideas between people. And uh, the way that model weights function is you have to do a huge amount of work to communicate, uh, to, to, to go from the model weights to trying to understand what the model weights mean. So it sounds to me like part of what you're saying is that this argument depends on understanding the machine as a machine and not as a subject that independently has first amendment rights is that is that fair well, so so i definitely don't think the machine has first amendment rights but i think that's actually orthogonal to the to the issue even if the machine doesn't have first amendment rights the people communicating information about the machine they definitely have the first amendment rights no that, that right that's exactly what i mean like what you're trying to do is focus more on the the human communication oh yes and if you focus aspect of human communication the the sort of element of the the machinery behind it kind of falls out of the picture that's right and to be fair to the people that think there's a first amendment issue they're not actually arguing that like 
chat GPT itself inherently has a First Amendment right that we should care about. They're saying that engineers have a right to communicate uh, about chat GPT. And so, you know, the, the problem is, and I should be honest about here, the line between communicating, like, like communicating between humans and, and sharing instructions to machines is not crystal clear. So like you could imagine, you know, there are lots of people that share non-human readable information with each other that we think is probably still um, First Amendment protected. So, um, you know, seismologists presumably share seismographic information. Geneticists share genetic information. Like, I don't, I don't think that information is any more understandable if you just open the, like, f- the file than weights and biases. They're all just numbers at the end of the day. And there are good reasons to think that um, a law that restricted the ability of seismologists to um, send seismologic information to each other would run afoul of the First Amendment. So you have to look at the sociological and communicative context that this is happening in. I think right now it's pretty clear that when people share models uh, online, um, they're not doing it to communicate information about the models or how to design models. Like they, they're doing it to enable the models to run on another machine. And so I think that is, that is the salient difference, right? And this is why, you know, all three of us, even though we don't think these first amendment arguments are good, would probably, I don't want to speak for my co-authors, but I suspect that they would agree that, um, you know, any, that if, if California tried to restrict, you know, uh, sharing information about new architectures, like in academic papers, that would be a definite First Amendment violation. See, academics favoring academic writing. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a real cabal. I want to go back to the policy merits of this. And it seems to me if this were a project in meat space where somebody was going to build, you know, a plant in California that, you know, we kind of, we know how to build it. We don't really understand how it works. It might put everybody in California out of work. And there's a small chance that it'll take over and destroy the world. We can't tell you that it won't. We can sort of tell you that it probably won't and that that's some number of generations down the line, though we're working toward that really fast. But, you know, it might just blow everything up. No one would say California cannot regulate that or, you know, require that you encase it in a big concrete dome uh, with a big retaining wall. No one would argue against regulation of that. Why? Now, leaving aside whether the specific regulations here are smart or dumb, why is the baseline assumption here that, you know, Anthropic and uh, Microsoft and OpenAI and all these companies just go get to build something and implement it. And the, the, the presumption against regulation and state action is so strong that we, you know, we start with all the reasons they can't regulate it rather than starting with a, wait a minute, these guys are you know, are, are building something that's potentially like has all these collateral effects for people they're not answerable to. And we should assume that this is a regulatable thing. And the only question is what in regulation in what direction? Yeah. So I think there are a couple of, a couple of reasons for that. One, I think is because, you know, in it's kind of the Silicon Valley intellectual circles, the idea that code is speech has just become extremely tenacious and people just keep saying code is speech over and over again. It's a very simple slogan uh, and they don't spend enough time unpacking what that means. Um, and so I think, you know, because people rightly are very concerned about First Amendment violations and not just as a legal matter, but as a kind of moral matter, you know, the First Amendment is, I think, one of the best parts of the of America's political and legal culture. There is that, there is that presumption. I mean, the other the reason is even if we think that some some amount of regulation is appropriate, and even if we think that the costs are really, you know, that the dangers are really high, and we're not worried about innovation, there's a question about what level this should happen. And, um, you know, again, I go back to the point I made earlier, I, you know, I'm just not sure why a state should be in the business of trying to regulate existential risk, if that's the concern, right? Now, if a state wants to regulate how something is used in its jurisdiction, I am totally, totally okay with that, Right. 
because different states can make different cost benefit trade offs on you know the benefits of AI versus the harms of AI. But Alan, you would never say that if we if we were talking about building a physical plant and Congress couldn't get its ass off the ground because it was too busy. You know, building it was it was too busy. I would totally uh, say know, that impeaching Hunter Biden and <laughs> um, you know, I, 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 yes, President Hunter Biden. <laughs> you would not say. Well, it's okay. You know, Doctor Strangelove can should be able to build his his doomsday device in in um you know Arizona, in Sausalito no be, yeah. because because California state legislature is the wrong body to prevent him from destroying the world. Well, I mean, I think part of that might have to do with whether or not you actually think this is going to destroy the world, right? So I would say I am in the camp Boom. of this is a janky technology that is not ready for prime time, was released way ahead of schedule, um, like way way ahead of when it should have been. And I think that everybody yelling about as existential risk are kidding themselves in an effort to get more money. Like if you just say like, <laughs> maybe we should regulate this industry because it can have concrete harms to people – you know, in any variety of ways that don't have to do with as existential risk. Like if you frame the question that way, does it look any different? Well, but I, I mean, I, I think it, I think it does. I think also the question is what are the potential benefits of, of, of this technology and should that be decided on the national versus state level? I mean, the, the thing with the thing with the thing with your example, Ben, about the physical plant is um, the reason that I think states have, you know, a, a legitimate interest in you know, regulating physical things in their juris- in their jurisdictions because those physical things have physical effects in their jurisdiction just by virtue of them being developed. But AI doesn't have any effect on a particular place just by virtue of being developed in that place. Once it's developed in a place, it's developed for all places. That's the whole point. And if it's developed for all places – then the costs are for all places, but the benefits are potentially for all places. And so it should be decided at, on the, you know, I think on the national, uh, national level. Now, you know, one can make that, one can say that as like a, one can make a constitutional version of the argument invoking like the dormant commerce clause, but that's probably not going to work. I think the better argument would just be for the you know, federal government to come in and say, look, we're going to preempt certain kinds of safety regulation because we want this technology to continue to develop. And if we want it to stop developing, we will be the ones that stop developing. But there's no reason to let one random state impose its values um, and its risk reward trade-offs on the whole country. And California is just in a very special position because all the AI labs are in California. But I don't see why that should give it a reason to define a, to decide a, the future of AI for the rest of us. This is, this is one and far from the First Amendment context where I, I think I'm much more sympathetic with the arguments, Alan, but this makes no sense to me because we do this all the time in every other industry. Like whether it's developing different type of cars with different fuel emission standards, which California de- develops different yeah, standards yeah, for. I'm not at all convinced that that's a good way of doing it. I mean, we have decided to let California set car emission standards and like, I guess it's sort of turned out okay, maybe, but I don't think that is in any way the ideal way of, of doing it. Right. And one can easily imagine a world in which we did not let California do that because California should not be the one that just gets to decide what car emission standards are, even though I happen to agree with California's policy on this. It, but it, the whole idea of federalism is that states have an ability to regulate and like actually like the essential plenary authority to regulate things that affect the safety of their citizens. And it's not limited to things that safety of your citizens and only your citizens, if it affects a person outside of your state, you can't regulate it. That is literally the way it's never worked in any other context. So it seems so odd to do that here and object to it here, especially because these companies can move somewhere else if they really have an issue. That's the laboratory of democracy that the federalism is supposed to provide, right? Um, there are costs to doing so, but that's true of any context. Like it just strikes me as very, very – industry friendly to all of a sudden start shove this in a different category. I don't know. I, I, I find myself a bit unconvinced by this particular aspect of this argument, um, which is very different from the first amendment, but that we were originally discussing for the record, but yeah, I mean, so, so it, it, you're, you're absolutely right that that is part of federalism, but federalism has always had its limits in that regard, right? There is such a thing as a dormant commerce clause, for example, and there is a long history of federal preemption of state regulations of things precisely because at some point, the balance of, yes, this maybe affects people in one state, but it affects people, a ton of people outside that state. And we don't want to give one state, you know, excessive influence. That balance tips in the favor of preemption. Now, I, again, I don't think 
this is the sort of thing that can be decided in some sort of theoretical way, which is why I don't favor constitutional challenges to what California is doing, either under the First Amendment or the Dormant Commerce Clause. But I personally think that AI is such a potentially transformative technology. It, it has such potential benefits. Even And even if on net it's not so great, the national security implications of America being a leader in AI are, are quite profound that I personally think this is an example where letting states, especially a state like California, which has such outsized influence, is a bad thing. Not because I'm not trying to be industry friendly towards like open AI. I mean, if anything, um, you know, what we've heard about open AI in the last couple of weeks makes me very nervous about them. Like I'm not here shill. I'm not trying to hear shill for the AI labs. Um, sure, sure. Uh, I mean, look, if you want to sponsor us, right? You know, whatever. Obviously, I'll change my tune. Uh, if you want to, you know, by advertising on, on, on rational security. Um, no, I'm not trying to show for the AI, AI labs. I just, I just don't like that California, um, the California legislators, you know, because all the AI labs are in California. And yeah, they could move, but like, I mean, that's going to be a multi year process and it's going to really slow down development of AI. And if we're going to do that, I think we should do that as a, as a nation, not as a, they're going to have to move all their AI factories, all their AI machines. They're going to have to move their AI. You're joking. If it was that, that'd be easy. Moving your AI factory machines is trivial. It's moving all your AI people. That's the hard part, right? If you're joking, but like, that's the actual hard part. And, you know, some people really like living in California because I don't know reasons. Well, I think, I think that's why California has leverage. But regardless, I think we uh, need to move on to our <laughs> third topic because we are running perilously low on time. Quinto, why don't we hand it over to you for that? Voting in the EU parliamentary elections wrapped up on Sunday, June 9th. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the results were a little bit of a surprise. There was a pretty significant far right surge in Central Europe, primarily in France and Germany. And it looks like, well, sort of centrist, center right parties will maintain a, a coalition, a majority in the EU parliament. There is a significant increase in the far right parties um, and the, the coalition that they will put together. As you mentioned, Scott, as a result of the very poor showing uh, by his own party, uh, French President Emmanuel Macron has called for a snap election, um, which raises the question of whether uh, Marine Le Pen's far right party will be able to take power. At the same time, there are some other complications here. You know, this wasn't a total victory for the far right. As I said, there is still a centrist bloc that has the majority. Um, there's also some interesting results in Eastern Europe where the far right actually did quite poorly. Uh, Viktor Orban's Fidesz party, for example, had a really bad showing. Um, so there are, I think, a, a bunch of different things that, that we can take away from this, but Scott, let me first go to you. What do you make of the results here? So they're definitely interesting. I don't know if I would describe them necessarily as surprising. Um, although, I, you know, I'm not somebody who watches European electoral politics super closely. I dip in and out periodically. I think it's surprising for a lot of people's kind of conceptions of Europe, particularly like non-Europeans conceptions of Europe. Um, like I, there's countless columns, uh, that we see in op-eds saying like, you know, Europe once seen as a liberal bastion showing it's not really a liberal bastion. You're like, okay. Yes. But that really hasn't been the case for honestly like 20 years now, right? Like we've seen the right on a pretty steady march in different parts of Europe with ebbs and flows, but establishing itself as a political force in Europe. And in some ways it always was. It was kind of socially marginalized and politically marginalized for a generation after World War II um, because of the ramifications of Nazism in Germany and and assorted other factors um, because of Cold War dynamics. And and now it's kind of been able to come to the fore, driven in substantial part by immigration anxiety, uh, a pretty, you know, familiar set of dynamics, I think, for the United States. This is pretty interesting this year because it just was a significant jump for a lot of these parties. And I think the thing that really has people maybe alarmed more is that it showed real strength by major parties that have major domestic parallels and are competing for national government leadership, particularly in Germany and France, right? Um, and so this was for the European Parliament. This obviously is a supranational entity. Um, the political parties at the national level kind of track into bigger electoral factions at the European Parliament level. But the real concern here isn't that there are more of those people at the European Parliament level because, again, power of that bloc hasn't really changed that much. They'll obviously have more say and more input because they're more, have more of a presence, but 
the leadership hasn't clearly changed and it's very possible might be the same figures basically in charge um, after the result of this election. The real barrier is that is this a bellwether for what national elections in Germany and France are going to look like the next time around? And that's where Macron's strategy comes in because he's calling – I mean not the bluff, but he's he's putting his money in the pot to say, no, th- that's this isn't the same thing. And, and there is a logic here, I think. Like the European parliament election is significant. But the European Union is a uh, driver of anxiety of a lot of the people who are most mobilized around this issue set, right? Like the issues we saw around Brexit uh, a couple of years ago are reflections of sentiments that are in lots of countries in Europe and reflect in a lot of these far-right parties. And they're closely tied to immigration and other uh, kind of concepts about uh, conventional liberalization across national borders, right? And, and so – you can imagine a scenario where voters who feel strongly about those issues and particularly critical of those issues will be much more vot- motivated to vote and organize around an election to the bodies that are seen as problematic for that issue set and that are seen as kind of being not the ones responsible for day-to-day governance. Whereas if it's day-to-day governance who runs your military, who runs your police, who runs your courts, who runs your what have yous, you might be hesitant to put it in the hands of parties that are seen as much more fringe and having much more outlandish views. And that's what Macron is, I think, is kind of betting on here. He's saying you the success of this faction at the European Parliament level will not translate to national politics. And I'm going to prove it to you so that I don't have to deal with the rest of my time in office with these rumors that in fact the far right is going to trounce me over the next election handily and therefore we will be able to exercise much more soft power in terms of agenda setting and maybe fundraising and things like that. Instead, he's really calling the bluff uh, or not the bluff, you know, putting his money and saying like, like let's actually put the proof in the pudding. Show me what uh, – that this is actually going to happen at the national level. The real risk is that he's wrong, right? And then he has to deal with a much more conservative legislature that is – uh, on top of that, you know, ha- dominated by the uh, essentially national front, the, you know, Marine Le Pen faction that has been a persistence presence in French politics for a long time, has been kind of slowly inching closer and closer to being a viable political party, but has a pretty atrocious past and has always been seen as pretty marginal. <laughs> That's one way to describe it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, to say the least. Uh, so, you know, it, it, that this is that sort of pattern. Um, but these groups, like part of their getting the um, of getting more political salience has been they've been trying to bec- look more conventional, focused on particular issues where they have political advantage while trying to marginalize some of their more radical parts of their platform, right? Like that's why we've seen more conservative parties come to win elections in Italy and other places is by, by we're trying to normalize themselves. And so in some way, maybe he's cutting off the opportunities for them to normalize themselves and build on the momentum of this election by forcing them to jump into a national political arena on a shorter time frame. Well, I think so. One one interesting thing that we've seen is that there's – I will say I do not follow French politics closely and I'm going to apologize if I mispronounce anything in advance. Sorry, I don't speak French. Apologize um, to Natalie. Natalie would be the one that's – the French <laughs> yes. people don't care, but Natalie is the Je one that – Je ne so the, there's been a fight between the French Conservative Party and uh, Marine Le Pen's party, which used to be called National Front and I guess is now called National Rally for some reason, where uh, the leader of the Conservative Party, Eric Chiedi, announced that he would be open to forming a coalition with the far-right National Rally, which immediately led to an uproar. Um, as far as I can tell, what happened this morning was that he locked himself into the party offices. The party locked him out of their Twitter account. Um, and now he is no longer the leader of the party, precisely because a lot of the other party members were angry at the suggestion uh, that they would align with National Rally, given that, you know, in France, the question of a conservative bloc aligning with a far right nationalist bloc uh, allowing the nationalist bloc to take power has a very particular history in this context, especially if you're a party as the conservatives are who are sort of modeling themselves in the legacy of Charles de Gaulle. Um, so I do think there are some interesting dynamics happening there. So I, I think the details of this are really interesting. Um, but I just want to zoom out for a second because I want to go back to a point that Scott made about Europe. You know, we think of Europe as liberal, but maybe it's not so liberal. And I think this just underscores the fact that, um, you know, whatever challenges we have in the United States – with respect to our political system, which are profound, they are just as profound, if not larger in, in Europe. Their immigration situation, which I think is responsible, honestly, for the vast majority of these results, is much more serious, much more difficult, frankly, than ours is. 
and they don't have a robust economy to buffer that. When the pie is growing, it is easier to be okay with more people because there's more pie for everyone. And, you know, the United States at least, and again, not downplaying um, how controversial immigration is or just how confused the public's understanding of the economic situation is. Generally, well, has, the immigration often grows economies by in and of itself. Yeah, no, I, I understand that, but that's, I'm trying to make a different point here, which is, um, uh, because of the EU's long standing structural decline in living standards, um, and its stagnation, even while there has been a lot of immigration, I don't think immigration is what caused Europe's economic stagnation. I think Europe's own policies, right? This flirting with degrowth across a number of, of ways, you know, some of it's green degrowth, some of it's just kind of um, old style um, statism. That means that um, Europe's ability to and willingness to um, uh, accept and integrate immigrants is itself much smaller, right? In, even if those immigrants are actually doing um, their part to make Europe's economy better than it otherwise would be, which is, I suspect, probably the case. Um, and as climate change continues, those pressures will only uh, get bigger. So, you know, I'm very much of, I'm very much in the camp that this is a uh, massive warning sign for, you know, left parties and centrist parties in Europe. Um, and, and if they continue to go the way that they are doing, they're going to be sort of discredited and basically die out um, in large parts of, of Europe. Well, folks, that is all the time we have together for this week. So we'll have to leave our discussion there, but this would not be rational security. Of course, we did not leave you with some object lessons to ponder over. In the week to come, Benjamin Wittes, I know you have to leave us a little bit before the end of our recording time today. So why don't you share your object lesson with us first? What do you have for us this week? Today, as we record, is June 12th. I think rational security will come out on the 13th. But uh, today uh, is the 12th. And uh, in case you didn't know this, that is the national day of the Russian Federation. <laughs> June 12th is colloquially known as hashtag Russia Day. And I have my own particular way of celebrating Russia Day, um, which I will be uh, doing this evening. But I, I want to ask all of the listeners how you celebrate Russia Day. <laughs> so I'm going to be out there, uh, this evening on at Boris Nemtsov Plaza, um, uh, with uh, some Ukrainian friends and a, a small projector. And I, I just wanted to wish everybody a happy Russia Day and urge everyone to celebrate it in your own special individual way. I mean, I, to be clear, I celebrate Russia Day by being grateful that my parents emigrated from Russia before I was born. <laughs> that's, that's how I celebrate Russia Day. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, your parents, uh, emigrated before Russia Day was created. That is, that is true. Because Russia Day prior to, uh, uh, Vladimir Putin's, uh, presidency was in fact called Russian Independence Day. And it was the day that Russia declared independence from the Soviet Union. Uh, so it actually has, uh, a, you can think of it as breakup of the Soviet Union Day, but that's not the way they present it in the, uh, for example, the Twitter feed of the uh, Russian uh, Ministry of the uh, Foreign Affairs or the Russian Embassy Twitter feed, which is draped, or the Russian Embassy itself, which is draped with big Dinyom Rossiya banners today. So we're gonna we're gonna have some fun with it. And you should figure out your own special way of celebrating Russia Day. Well, on that celebratory note, let me turn it over to you, Alan. What do you have for us today for Object Lesson on this Russia Day? So my, uh, my big professional news of the year is that I got tenure at the University of Minnesota Law School, which is, which is wonderful. I now get to be a Minnesotan forever, and my Twitter feed gets to be even more unchained. Uh, but my object lesson is the ob I got tenure. Uh, well, it's like a long drawn out process, uh, but I got tenure a while ago this year. But I finally got the physical embodiment of tenure, which at the University of Minnesota is a granite red apple that they give wow. to everyone who gets tenure. And it has a little engraving, which is which is lovely. I love this thing. Like the, it just sits on my desk. I think it's really beautiful. I play with it all the time. Um, and it turns out that you can, I look this up, uh, and I'll, I'll drop it in the show notes. You can buy your own red barble apple for, uh, you know, if you buy one of them, it costs $32, but if you buy 26 or more, they're only $29 each. So 
you know, I think this is a great gift, right? And especially for the cost to give myself tenure on it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Probably the problem is it doesn't come with tenure. Um, the tenure you have to do separately, but I think for, you know, the teacher in your life, a, a red granite apple, it's, um, it's, it's kind of lovely. I really, I really like this. So, yeah. How many teeth sadly lost on red granite apples? Oh, it is, it is very hard. <laughs> Quinta, what do you have for us this week? I have a follow up on our segment from last week on the executive order on the border. Um, I was desperately hoping that the American Immigration Council would put out their always excellent explainer before we recorded so that I wouldn't be flying blind. They did not. I flew blind. I hope I didn't mess it up. But the explainer is now available. Um, and it is extremely readable and gives a very good overview of all of the things that I may have aired on um, and is sort of just a generally, I think, a, a good and even handed guide as to what exactly this does and what effects it might or might not have. So if you are interested in this issue, I definitely recommend it. Well, for my object lesson this week, I am bringing a uh, potentially life changing recommendation to be spectacled nerds uh, everywhere. Uh, that I have recently discovered because I am not just a spectacled nerd and have been my entire life, but I am one with a thuggishly flat face. Uh, the phrenologists would be put me automatically in prison if they had their way. Uh, that unfortunately, among other things, leads to what is not simply some sort of strange academic affect, but the fact that my nose, my glasses almost always end up on the tip of my nose and slide off my face in a very, very frustrating fashion, particularly if I am been in any way exerting myself in the slightest bit sweaty or have been moving my head or have been looking down at my small children or cooking dinner or anything like that. It has driven me nuts literally for my entire life that I've been wearing glasses that may will not stay on my face. And then I discovered this thing, which it's a company called Roca or Ruka. I'm actually not sure how to pronounce it. I think it's Roca, which it's a bunch of glasses that they market to hardcore athletes and people doing things in gyms and hauling things. Hardcore podcasters. Hardcore podcasters. Hardcore hardcore think tank analysts. Yeah. I enjoy watching football and I like like going hiking. I can't really claim that much hardcore uh, athletic uh, activities otherwise. But I bought these glasses because they have these little pads on them that are made of a material that if you are – that basically adhere to your skin so that you can oh. actually run with these things or do whatever activity. And they're freaking amazing. I have to say, I've had them for several weeks now. They stay on my face. They don't slide off. I have exercised in them. I've hiked in them. I've cooked in them. Uh, I was out in the sun cooking this past weekend in them and getting very sweaty. And they never slipped off my face or fell on the grill like other glasses of mine have done in the past. Uh, I have been out uh, hiking. I've done Peloton rides. They're phenomenal. Uh, and I can't recommend them enough. If you have similar problems with glasses as I do, this is the first thing I found after years that finally fixes it. So highly recommend it. Uh, and uh, best of luck to those spectacle folks out there, no matter how core, how hardcore you are in keeping your glasses on your face. With that, that brings us to the end of this week's episode. Rascal Security is, of course, a production of Lawfare, so be sure to visit us at lawfaremedia.org for our show page with links to past episodes, for our written work and the written work of other Lawfare contributors, and for information on Lawfare's other phenomenal podcast series. While you're at it, be sure to follow us on Twitter or X at RETL Security and be sure to leave a rating or review wherever you might be listening. In addition, sign up to become a material supporter of Lawfare on Patreon for an ad-free version of this podcast and other special benefits. For more information, visit lawfaremedia.org slash support. Our audio engineer and producer this week was Noam Osband of Goat Rodeo, and her music, as always, was performed by Sophia Yan. And we are once again edited by the wonderful Jen Pacha. On behalf of my co-host, Alan Quinta, and our special guest, Benjamin Wittes, I am Scott R. Anderson. We will talk to you next week. Till then, goodbye.